I had been living at the San Francisco airport and she didn't know it. What do you mean living at the San Francisco airport? I had been sleeping at the San Francisco airport. Why not work at Starbucks or something? I'm just like- Absolutely, I can understand the question, but you have to understand this is why there are homeless people. If you were lucky enough to have not grown up poor, you might have a hard time understanding just how deeply it can drag down even the smartest, most hardworking individuals. The impact of poverty is at least twofold. There's the physical toll from the struggle to make ends meet. The sheer energy it takes to eke out a living is draining. It's expensive to be poor. Then there's the mental side of poverty. Money becomes the source of worry and fear. Its absence causes pain, yet there's never enough to alleviate that worry. But Backstage Capital founder Arlen Hamilton has no time for that. Going from homeless to that in five years, I'm very proud of that. There are three numbers to watch out for in Arlen's story. 50,000, Arlen's first outside investment. Six million, the total amount Mark Cuban has invested in Backstage Capital. And two, the percentage of companies that receive investment from the fund. Here's how Arlen Hamilton went from homeless to running her own $20 million venture capital fund. For CNBC Make It, I'm Nate Skid. This is Founder Effect. Arlen was born in Jackson, Mississippi, into a household that was full of love but short on cash. She, her mom, and her little brother Alfred settled in Dallas, Texas. The small family changed apartments six times while she was in school, but her mom made sure that she stayed in the same school district. If nothing else, she made sure Arlen's social and academic life remained stable. So I never had to change schools, and I just really appreciate that more and more as, a, as an adult. Uh, but it was a little chaotic. Arlen says she was always one of the smartest kids in class. She enrolled in honors classes and got top marks, but spent too much time in the principal's office. I breezed through the academic part of mostly, mostly. Everyone assumed I would go to college. I was voted most likely to succeed um, a couple of years in a row. For half of my senior year, we were bouncing around from hotel to friends' couches. You know, we moved back to Mississippi for a few weeks where, we, where my mom was born. To me, the idea of going to college, even if I got a scholarship, I thought about the living expenses and taking away time from helping my mom and finally being an adult and maybe, you know, bringing in more money. It just, I couldn't see myself doing that. So to me, it was very simple. I wasn't going to go to college, even though I wanted to. I don't think... Um, the kind of fear or at least the idea that money isn't a given and what that can do to you and like how that can motivate you. So I'm wondering, did, was there anything within that experience that still sticks with you? It stuck with me, but not in the way that I think people may think. Um, I used to hate money. I used to be so afraid of it and also so just angered by it because the lack of it was the thing that was making my mom cry and the thing that was making us not, ha you know, not have certain things. And I would go to school in certain clothes or have my hair a certain way and people would make fun of that. And it just, I understood that that was because of money and, and nothing else. So I always said, I'm going to be rich as a child. I'm going to be rich so I can just like, I'll never be in this position again. I'll, I'll be able to control things. Arlen's first lesson in extracting herself from poverty came from an unlikely source while working at Pudgy Brothers Pizza in Dallas, Texas. I remember that dude. <laughs> And it was Rodney. <laughs> he was a white male who went to my school. Uh, I think we were the same age. He might have been a little older. He would just, at the end of every sh of his shift, he would just pour his money onto onto in front of me, you know, to count it. And it was just like ten times or even more what I was making for the same hours. And and he was running around, of course, on his car and, and making these deliveries. But what I remember about him was that he was like stress free. And I was like running from the phones, making pizzas, getting everything prepared for him. At first I was upset and mad and kind of like, this isn't fair. But then I'm like, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to study Rodney. I'm going to study him and take what I want from that. What she took away from Rodney was that pay isn't necessarily tied to how hard you physically work. She labored twice as hard as he did, but didn't make half as much. Rather, it was the type of work that mattered. Even though she knew full well that a college degree offered her the greatest chance to escape intergenerational poverty, she didn't make it more than a few hours at a community college before dropping out. I took some, some courses at community college, which I really liked. Um, but again, it was just sort of like focus on work, just focus on getting some money so we're not all broke all the time. 
And that's really what it was. And people were going off to all these different cities and kind of, you know, you were hearing about people, what they're up to. And I don't think I suffered too much during that time of like FOMO or anything, but I just felt like it just, to me, there was no other option. This is when Arlen began showing her entrepreneurial spirit. So she talked her way into managing a U.S.-based concert tour for a little-known indie pop band from Norway called Golden Boy. She turned that into a string of gigs, putting on live concerts across the U.S. How did you talk your way into that? I sent out 100 messages to uh, tour managers and production managers that I had individually researched. And they were all, all you know, individual messages um, over like a two-month period. And I received 20 responses. I received three in-person interviews and one led to, uh, you know, the kind of kickoff of working on a larger stage. Sure, the pay was lousy and the nights long, but her job was exciting. At first, she was enamored with the artists, but as time wore on, she began eavesdropping on their management teams. I would notice that they were making investments in a place called Silicon Valley and in tech startups. And I started learning these, like hearing this jargon and hearing these things, but not in public. It would be these, I'd walk past the conversation or somebody would be flown in for something and I need to, to prepare their, their flight, right? And I'm like, why, are, why is this musician meeting with this technical person? It just, you know, I was trying to put the pieces together almost uh, the beginnings of an Aaron Brockovich story or something. I was just like, what's going on here? And then the more I learned, the more I'm like, wait a second, I I know what this is. I've seen Airbnb, I've seen Twitter. I know what, what they're talking about. And that's when I said, well, I've always felt like an entrepreneur. I've always felt, I've always started something. I'll start my own tech company. And I knew that that would, that would be my path. That's when I learned that, um, 90% of funding goes to white men in this country and, and affluent white men. Arlen tried and failed to get a tech company off the ground. She was now in her early 30s and had never earned more than $20,000 a year. But during the process, she realized that to make real change, she needed to create an investment fund of her own. How did you even begin to think about investing? I couldn't be an angel investor because I didn't have any money. And I was in fact broke and homeless and for most of this, and you know, it was just a whole thing. But I thought I can negotiate with people. So I spent three and a half years trying to raise any money for a fund. Cause I saw the people had, people had raised funds. I can try to raise a fund. And I got no's left and right, hundreds and hundreds of meetings, no, or calls, no. But then in September of 2015, I got my first yes from Susan Kimberlin, who is an angel investor in, in San Francisco, who I met after going, you know, one way ticket towards Silicon Valley. And I had been living at the San Francisco airport and she didn't know it. Wait, what do you mean living at the San Francisco airport? I had been sleeping at the San Francisco airport like on the outside, like before the ticketing because of the way, you know, the airports are. And I would roll up a pair of jeans and it would be my pillow. And I'd put my suitcase and I had a lap laptop so I could sign on to the Wi-Fi, but I would put my suitcase in front of my face so that I wouldn't have to like have eye contact with people as they're walking by as I'm laying on the, on the ground, you know, on this hard floor. And I would get up and, you know, freshen up a little bit and, uh, you know, public restrooms. You know, I mean, why not work at Starbucks or something? I'm just like- I've been working since I was 15. To work at Starbucks, you have to have an address. I applied to all kinds of places. I, I was turned down by Airbnb. I was turned down by Kohl's. I was turned down to work at Kohl's in retail for, I forgot what it was. It was minimum wage or whatever it was. And I was in my 30s. And I'm like, why can't I do that? And so it's one, it's, it's absolutely, I can understand the question, but you have to understand this is why there are homeless people. It is very difficult to go from no address, you're sleeping on the floor to then have any kind of way to work for two to three weeks before you get your first paycheck. You go in, you know, is there's a hygiene issue. There's all sorts of things that kind of, leave you kind of stunted. 
In 2020, over 580,000 people experienced homelessness in the United States on a single night. And that was up nearly 13,000 individuals from 2019. But it was at an event for venture capitalists that she realized the power of her idea, that there was untapped potential in founders of color. The more race came up as a topic of discussion, the more uncomfortable the room got. As they leaned back, Arlen leaned in. They were uneasy. There was no, you know, I was like the only other black person in the, in the audience. And they shifted and they got, they got real weird. And I'm like, that's weird. Like, I just listened to all these white dudes talk about money, making money, investing, diligence, all that. They're talking about the exact same thing. There was a person on that panel who had like a $10 million per year company that he built from nothing. There was another person on that panel who had invested a hundred million or more. They weren't talking about anything that was, that should be foreign or considered alien, right? The reaction from the crowd didn't sit well with Arlen. So while squatting at the San Francisco International Airport, she penned a blog post titled Dear White Venture Capitalists. If you're reading this, it's almost too late. So it was a combination of Drake's album, his mixtape, and Dear White People, the movie that had just come out. Dear White Venture Capitalists. And so I wrote this blog post and overnight uh, it just went crazy and, and I got an incredible amount of inbound from it. Arlen began forming the basis of her pitch. Underestimated black and brown founders were finding incredible success while suffering from a severe lack of underinvestment. What if they were properly funded? Do you remember the date you got your first investment? September 15th, 2015. What was your pitch? 90% of venture funding goes to white men in, in a country where they make up one third of the, of the demographics. So you'd have to believe that they're somehow smarter, better, faster than anyone else, including any woman, to believe that that is fair. Also, because it is proven multiple times, multiple studies and, and practicality, that diversity breeds more, uh, is more lucrative. And also it's just, you know, you have a better chance of reaching and reaching a larger audience. And on top of all of that, the, the underestimated or at the time underrepresented founders that I knew were doing so much with so little. I could compare and say like this, this person didn't have any outside funding, but they somehow got their product made. Well, this same type of company had $2 million and they have fewer customers, right? I could show those types of examples. So if they're doing so much with so little, what happens when we give them more? And it was just as, it was just as simple as that. And then to say, you know, in a few years, and this is 2012 through 15, I'm saying in a few years, the world of tech is gonna look more like the country. Do you wanna be hit by the wave or riding the wave? Arlen didn't wanna be seen as some sob story asking for a pity donation. She hid the fact that she was homeless, not because she was ashamed, because she knew if she was gonna be successful, she needed to be seen as worthy, not a donation. I didn't want her to know that part of things. I wanted her to invest in me because she wanted to and believed in my thesis. And um, it kind of was sort of slow. And, and, and then I said to her uh, early September, I said, I'm, I'm gonna go have a meeting with this organism, this company. If I can negotiate X deal with this company, having no experience here or whatever, will you invest in me once and for all? And she said, if you can make that deal happen, yeah, I'll do that. So I go into that company, I, I strike up a deal with them. That's not monetary, it's more like, you know, you were able to negotiate something kind of cool. It's a deal. And I, yeah, and I let her know. And within 24 hours, she sent me a text and she said, I'm in. Um, I, saw, I saw that text and I just kind of, I, I remember exactly the corner I was in because it was by an acai place that I used to treat myself to. And I had any kind of like, if I had $7, I was going there. Um, and I just kind of did like a little dance, you know, it's like, woo, okay. And then I just, I buttoned up. I, I kind of got my ducks in a row and I got a flight to Los Angeles. And I promise you, I mean, I didn't celebrate. I, I just was ready. What did you do with the money and how much was it? Can I ask? Originally it was 25,000 because it was supposed to be like, cause we were making 25, I was going to make $25,000 investments, which is kind of an angel size considered. So she originally gave me that, but then she said, you know, you need to have like an office and a 
kind of prop yourself up. So she gave me 25,000 to make my first investment and 25,000 to set up shop. The effectiveness of Arlen's pitch created a snowball effect. Susan's money helped get Arlen off the streets, but her contacts proved to be much more valuable. A cool thing happened like in early 2016 where Stuart Butterfield from Slack got in touch with me on Twitter, DM, and I had never met him or talked to him. And I still to this day do not know how he found out about me. Maybe it's just seeing the blog or something. He said, hey, can I invest in your company? Uh, and I'm like, am I in your fund? And I'm like, uh, let me check my calendar. Yes, you can. And this was when he had paper wealth, you know, he didn't had any cashed out or anything. So he was, it was more of an angel investment, but being able to put his name on there when I, when I reached out to Mark Andreessen, or actually Mark Andreessen reached out to me, and then I reached back with a question about investing, <clears throat> he was able to see Stuart Butterfield. And then I would text someone, you know, who I had met along the way and say, hey, can you get in touch with this person and put in a good word? And it was just like all this forward motion of not, not taking a day for granted, just continually using that momentum. Perhaps her biggest win came in 2019 at the South by Southwest Conference in Austin, Texas, when she shared the stage with Mark Cuban. So he was super cool. I thought he was really, you know, we're both, I'm, I'm from Dallas and my brother, my younger brother, Rook, loves the Mavericks, he loves Cuban. And I watched Shark Tank for 10 years as if I'm a, a fifth or sixth panelist yelling at the screen. What's so your name? Yeah, I just thought he was cool and I was interested to see how he would be behind the scenes and he was just really chill for a billionaire, you know what I mean? He was just like, nobody was around him, he was just doing his thing. I asked him, you know, if he would invest in the fund and he said, no, I don't like investing in funds because I, I love talk, working with founders, that's where I get my thrill. So I said, okay. And then about a month after that, there was a press piece that had incorrectly you know, or their opinion had said that I had failed, quote unquote, in raising my fund because it wasn't raised yet. It was very odd. It was very odd. And a lot of people were up, were upset about it because of the way it was phrased. It was very, and, and a lot of people's opinion, including mine, biased, but it, it really caused a lot of trauma to have that. And he got in touch with me that same day. Mark Cuban got in touch with me that same day. And he said, I'm sending you a million dollars invest however you want you didn't fail anything and he gave me some great terms he gave me higher uh, upside than i've got on any other fund his his decision i had autonomous uh investing ability wow. and then on top of that last year after george floyd was murdered on television um he reached out and he said i want to do five million more i'm looking from your perspective though which is like altruism is great and you definitely want to do good but like you got to make money too right like like so i'm wondering how do you think through that like what's your strategy or philosophy on um who who to get who to invest in and who not what's altruistic versus what's a real business case i'll say it like this uh through other things like my publishing through speaking through all sorts of you know academy stuff that i have I have money, right? Personal money. And through that, I have uh, about a half a million dollars into scholarships right now. And that's, you know, going from homeless to that in five years, I'm very proud of that. So when I want to do things that are altruistic, when I want to do things that are um, philanthropic, I do them. But Backstage Capital is for-profit and sharky. What do you mean sharky? I mean, we invest in 2% of what we see. You know, we are, we are not here for the heartwarming side of this. We are very complimentary to founders. We're very aligned with founders. And we have some of the, like, the most friendly terms when it comes to deals that we strike because we don't want to get in their way. Right. We're not making investments based on the color of your skin. We're making investments based on what we believe will make us money back for, our, for ourselves and for our stakeholders. What's your advice to founders? Well, my advice is ultimately is like to remain yourself. Because if you heard anything in my story, the one through line is that I just kind of stayed myself the whole time. And anytime I can tell you, anytime I tried to stray from that or I thought 
oh, I better, I better button up or I better do this other thing because I have to conform, it went wrong. It did not help. It made the situation worse. And so it takes longer to get where you're going and it's more difficult to get where you're going when you're being yourself. But once you get there, you, you, you're much happier because you're there as yourself and not in a costume.